Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, as you can see, it is just me and not Hannah. Unfortunately, she is unable to be with us today, although she was very much involved in the project I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I'm a learning and access curator at MUSA, the Museum of the University of St. Andrews. And what I'm going to be talking about is an audience research project that we've been carrying out in collaboration with the University's School of Classics. And the project was called Through a Glass Darkly, and it was designed to um, gather empirical data on the impact of digital media on learning, and in particular on vista perceptions of archaeological material. So during the session, I'll give a very quick introduction to the museum and our project objectives, and then I'm going to attempt to recreate a mini version of one of our experiments with you guys and hopefully demonstrate a few of our findings. <laughs> so um, we have over 115,000 objects um, relating to the history of the university and the subjects that have been taught there. And um, we're also quite a small museum unit with um, just 12 members of staff, uh, many of whom are part-time. And um, we run three different public venues, MUSA, the Bell Pettigrew Museum of Natural History, and an open access collection store. We run a very active learning program, which is aimed at schools, nurseries, the academic community itself, um, and informal learners of all ages, and about 7,000 people take part in that each year. So um, how are we trying to engage audiences through digital channels? Our digital engagement um, ranges from providing collections, information, images and media online to um, running some virtual reality events of the type you can see here, which was actually done in conjunction with our museum and gallery studies students. There are also a number of other platforms we use, like digital learning environments like Glow for schools in Scotland. Um, and although we don't yet have our complete um, collections database online, we're getting really close, um, we do have content on umbrella sites like Scran and Art UK, as I'm sure many of you do. And we've developed some microsites for specific collections, including our art collection, and most recently the Cypriot Archaeology collection. So um, in 2016, we had the opportunity to really test out how audiences were responding to some new digital 3D models of our collections. Professor Rebecca Sweetman from the School of Classics approached us at MUSA um, to collaborate on a research project which focused on the Bridges collection of archaeology that you can see here. Um, this collection was formed by a couple who lived out in Cyprus, the Bridges, um, in the 1960s, and they just had a personal interest really in this type of material and later donated their collection to the university for educational use. And it is really heavily used in teaching and also in our children's workshops and we use some of the material in our exhibitions. But the problem with it is that it's housed within a, a university department, um, so it's not normally publicly accessible um, except by appointment and you would have to know about it in the first place, you'd have had to find that information. The other issue with it is that having developed originally as a private collection, when it was transferred to us, it was quite poorly documented, so we don't have an awful lot of information about exactly where objects came from on archaeological sites, and so therefore how to interpret them properly. And so the aims of this project were to improve public access to this collection um, through digitization and specifically the creation of 3D models, and then to try and give back context, archaeological context, to the artifacts through further research to comparable collections. And Professor Sweetman was particularly interested to see whether doing so might change the way that people thought about the material. There's a tendency with this sort of stuff where you don't have the full archaeological uh, provenance to maybe look at the artifacts more as objects of art 
rather than thinking about what they tell us about human history. So um, we wanted to try and find out, did it change when people looked at different forms of interpretation, how they perceived of the material? And last but not least, to actually look at the learning potential of using different types of interpretation. So what was involved to do this? Well, first off, the um, 3D digitization of the artifacts. And having already tried using 3D laser scanning and found that to be very time consuming, we opted to try photogrammetry and used um, free software to create and store the models. And then planning the actual research experiment. So the original idea had been to put a selection of artifacts on display in a fairly traditional style museum case, and then nearby to um, put the 3D models onto computers in our education room, which is called the Learning Loft, um, and then to finish up by having a kind of facilitated handling session with some of those same artifacts. But because we've got also this feely box in our museum that's quite popular, it seemed like a good opportunity as well to look at how people respond to some of the same things through touch alone. And so to do that, we um, needed to make some replicas and um, we engaged the services of a contemporary potter, George Young, who you can see there. Um, he's copying one of the spindle whorls that you can see here. Um, and so that was lots of fun. That's a totally different talk, really, about all the things that we learned through that process of recreating artifacts. It was fantastic. Um, and then four of those replicas were put inside the Feely box and the whole interactive exhibition was installed in the learning loft. Like any audience research project, we had to think about the best way to gather data um, and opted in the end mainly to use focus groups for several reasons. One was that we were going to need um, someone around to supervise the handling of objects anyway. Secondly, we thought we'd probably get better qualitative data through that approach and we'd be able to probe the responses to the questions. And thirdly, because we knew from prior experience of doing questionnaires in the museum that you actually have to go and harass people to fill the things in. So to ensure we had a decent data set, we thought that was probably the best approach. And then, of course, we had to represent different age groups, people who we might expect to already have prior knowledge of the material they were looking at, compared to people who didn't necessarily, and then people from within the university community and, and the general public. And so the sorts of focus groups we had included, for example, the Town Archaeology Society, um, the Classics students, Anthropology students, um, all groups who would expect to know something, perhaps, about the material, compared to um, school pupils, and kids who came along to one of our regular weekend workshops. And then uh, just a kind of general mail out to people on our list to see if anyone wanted to come along and join one of our focus groups. So in the process, we got 94 people taking part. And at this point, I'm going to hopefully go into this experiment. We'll just um, get this on. Right, I need a volunteer who is desperate to come up and try out something from this project, and I promise I won't put you on the spot. Yes, great, come on up. Um, possibly, I don't know, might be all right. Hello, do you come up here? <laughs> this is the low-tech bit, in case you're wondering. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. Where are you from? From North Carolina. Excellent. Well, you've travelled even further than me, then. <laughs> Right, I'm just going to, out of the way, put something in here. Right, pretend this is our feely box. Now, what I would like you to do is pop your hand in there, and can you describe what you are feeling inside this bag? Um, it, it feels like a ceramic ball that has a, um, a small hole, like a pinch pot, with a, a lip that sort of flares out at the, at the top, a little bit smaller than, say, a fist. Excellent. Really nice detailed description. Of course, I've got <laughs> curators here. Um, we're, we're not done yet, though. <laughs> OK, so you can go back to feeling it if you want. Have you any idea what it might be? Um, well, there's also a hole underneath the pot. I don't think it holds something like a vessel. I, I, almost feel like a notch underneath it. 
Um, it's not a whistle or anything, is it? Like another hole? No, I've not heard that Or some kind before. of instrument? I don't... Okay, so can you, can you feel the hole and can you yes. stick your finger into that hole? Is it big it's enough to do that? <laughs> if I dare say that. <laughs> no. Um, no, it's quite small, isn't it? Not, not quite sure. I was going to say I haven't, I haven't figured out exactly what it is yet. Okay, um, right, so you're not really sure what it is and no real idea then how it might be used. Do you notice anything else about it in terms of um, texture or...? It's very smooth um, and, and round and I'm trying to understand what this notch is around I guess the neck of it because uh -huh. that seems like it's, it's something distinct that would have to do with its purpose. Okay. So, but I'm not sure what that is yet. Great, okay. What we'll do is we'll move on to the next bit. If you'd like to just come up over here. These are our 3D scans. Um, and we just have a little look through here. Can you identify from this the object that you think you were touching? Def definitely this. Uh, okay, so one. we'll just open that one up. Okay, does anything surprise you now that you see the picture of it? Well, we'll just wait for it to open. Of course, I couldn't see the markings that were on it, so that's yeah. surprising, definitely. Um, and I'm, am I not allowed to read? I was going to say, yeah. people, that would make sense, some kind of... So you can, what you can do is you can click and you can rotate it and have a little look. Okay. Oh, that's excellent. So the notch was maybe for something to hang around their their neck and to hold it, perhaps. Oh, there's. Can you see it? Yes, yeah. that's what I was looking for. Okay. okay. So you think, in actual fact, that might be more like a, a sort of like a handle? You mean, mm. um, like some uh, like a necklace or something that it would hang from um, someone's neck or another place. Okay, great. So, because I think you probably saying that because it's quite a small thing, so you can imagine it being hung mm -hmm. as well. Okay. And um, when we talked about the um, the top of it, where there was the hole, so it's quite small, and I guess you have read what it is off the screen now. Yes. <laughs> so you know that it is a perfume bottle, an Ariabalos. I'll just show you the replica as well. There we go. Have a little look at that as well. Yeah, excellent. Is there anything else you see on that that you didn't notice before? This flat area here mm -hmm. that it would, I don't know, rest against something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then, of course, a, a little bit of a flat area at the bottom for it to um, sit still. Okay. I mean. Should we see if it sits level? Great, yes. yeah, okay, brilliant. So actually handling the real thing, Michelle has also noticed mm -hmm. that there is this flattened area which is like a thumbprint. Um, and uh, we don't know if that's accidental through the process of making the pot or whether it's actually a deliberate feature. I saw you putting your hands mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. and actually feeling it quite comfortably in your hand. And this is one of the things we noticed in our experiments, giving people the actual material, is that they started to play with it and figure out how things would be held and how they would be used. And one theory is that that would have been to grip it, it would have had perfumed oil inside it and used almost like a sort of roll-on deodorant. Mm -hmm. So um, it does make sense. Thank you very much Thank for you. being brave. <laughs> Okay, so just to um, summarise some of the results of the experiment, we had this question of whether things were seen more as art or as artefact, um, depending on the context in which they were displayed. And as you might imagine with these groups, there was lots of discussion about what the definition of art actually is, somewhat problematic perhaps, um, but not interestingly, not much discussion of what an artefact was or what archaeology was. There was definitely a tendency for people to think of the objects in the display case and on the computer screen more as art. 
Um, but it wasn't as clear-cut as that. It also came down to the type of object itself. So, for example, um, something like those little spindle walls that you saw earlier on um, would be seen as quite functional things, but if it was ornamental, like the little horse figurine or some of the other human figurines and masks, or it had a recognisable sort of design like on that bowl, then it would be seen as art more than a functional object. And then we looked at our results sort of format by format, and the sorts of things we discovered about the experience of looking at a display case was that it was very much a solitary experience. People in the group did not talk to each other while they were standing in front of the case. And some studies have indicated that that's a kind of European museum visiting um, sort of tradition, really, and it can be quite different in countries like India, where it's more sociable. Um, people didn't really spend very long looking in the case either. And during the discussions, they said that they thought this, the things we'd put in there must be more special or valuable or artistic because they were aware that a selection had been made, so they were aware of that kind of curatorial uh, decision-making process. And um, those of you who write labels for exhibitions will be pleased to see that people were definitely reading them because when we asked them what they thought things were and why, then quite often it was referenced back to the information that had been provided uh, with the objects. With the feely box, which was a bit like the experiment there, um, there was a very mixed response depending on the age and interest of the groups. Um, so although things like that tend to be thought of as activities for kids in museums, and sure enough it was the kids who just dived straight in, whereas adults were much more hesitant and kind of like, you really want me to put my hand in there? Um, they did actually really enjoy it once they got going and started describing the stuff that they could feel. Um, and they were going backwards and forwards between the feely box and the case, trying to identify which object it was that they were touching. But what the comments also showed was that there was much more of a tendency to focus on the weight of objects um, and the texture of them. So often people said things about how solid they were and um, really quite robust and the, the fact that they thought that they must have been used for this or that and they saw them much more as functional things. With the 3D reconstructions, again we got quite a mixed response and that seemed to depend very much on age and to an extent on prior knowledge. So as you probably expect, um, the kids loved it straight away they were uh, intuitively flicking through things, zooming right in, zooming out, often very quickly, actually. Um, and what was really interesting observing this was that they did it in a very social way, so there'd be a group of them around one screen, and even if it was only one of them manipulating the image, um, they would all be discussing it quite excitedly. Whereas, again, adults tended to do it sort of one person, one computer, in silence. Um, and even the students, actually, which surprised me a bit. Um, there were quite a few comments about the experience that they felt that they were distanced from the material. It just didn't feel as immediate as some of the other things, I suppose. Um, but also that had the effect that it somehow decreased the value of what, what it was they were looking at. And someone said, as you can see here, that it felt just like another computer image, one of hundreds that are available on the internet. So it kind of lost its specialness. Um, the one difference with that was the anthropology students and the museum and gallery studies students and the classics students all spent quite a lot of time on these models and they navigated their way from the actual model images through to all the contextual information. And um, they really enjoyed being able to zoom up and look at the details of things and um, could obviously see its potential as a research tool and talked about how good it would be to be at home and be able to log on to that and check stuff out. As for the object handling with the real things from the case, this was by far the most popular option for adults. People liked being able to use um, lots of sensors at the same time, and there was much more enthusiasm and interaction amongst the group. Um, there was also much more discussion about the way things were decorated and feeling a sort of sense of connection to the maker, thinking about the kinds of decisions that they'd made. So um, what are the implications for museums? 
I think the study has shown that the choice of interpretive media can actually have some influence on visitor perceptions of what they're looking at. And so really to be aware of introducing kind of unconscious or un unintended bias through the actual choice of medium. Um, but perhaps more importantly, by having those four different things that we tested um, on the same occasion, it's shown that having all those different routes into the same set of objects really helps people's understanding of the material. And likewise, locating your interactives as close as possible to the originals so that people can reference between them, rather than doing what sometimes happens where you have all of the kind of hands-on stuff confined into a, a zone of its own, like a discovery center. Um, and I think, of course, given the continued popularity of the object handling and the kind of special sense people get from doing that, that it is important to keep continuing offering those opportunities, even if it does take that bit more effort and capacity, um, just to have that in within the education program. Uh, because we're experimenting with the digitization process ourselves, we learned quite a few lessons along the way, such as that photogrammetry isn't suited to all types of objects, like very shiny things become too reflective. So you, you have to take lots and lots of photos around an object from different angles. And um, from that point of view, you need to choose things that can support themselves, because you need to be able to turn them over and then do other angles. So we had trouble with um, some of the round-bottomed vessels, because they just wanted to roll over. Um, and then you can see here, this is kind of what happens when things go wrong, and the software hasn't recognized the base of this little baby feeder and not knitted it together. Um, and there's something weird going along the edge of it as well, which might be because it's quite an angular object, and then that causes shadows. I think um, probably the biggest lesson for us, and here I'm going to admit to uh, being a complete newbie, was that um, we were using free software, and at some stage in the project, we discovered that there'd been an update to it. And in the process, it had lost a heck of a lot of our models. So just that last cautionary note to back up everything in lots of places. Um, in terms of future use of these models, uh, we're working with the School of Computer Science and we're hoping to set up some sort of virtual museum environments so that students can have free reign on the collections through the 3D models and be able to practice curatorial skills in researching objects, interpreting them and displaying them. Um, and beyond that, of course, it's um, really helpful to be able to have all these things available online for independent research, both within the university and beyond. We're also looking at how these models might be useful in schools. As I said, we've done a few sessions, but we're at a very early stage. And what we need to do is get together with teachers much more and talk to them about how they think they could either use the technology itself, given that digital literacy um, underpins everything else in the curriculum. Um, but certainly what we've seen is the way that the technology just grabs the kids' interest. And um, we think perhaps the teachers may be interested in using a simplified version of the photogrammetry to do all sorts of things themselves with their classes. But we'll see once we've done some more um, consultation. So if you would like to find out more about the project, um, have a look at our website, our blog, and our Facebook pages. And um, we've also written up the findings of our research in an article which we're hoping will be published in the Journal of Material Culture. So, um, and do get in touch. And finally, a thank you to all members of the project team and to all of you for listening today.